still mediocre, underperformed compared to students in Asia, Canada, New Zealand, and Germany. In a brand new Fox News op-ed, our next guest lays out some major challenges that we're facing here in America as far as our schools and our students are concerned and how we can improve. Joining us now to discuss education in 2018 and the three major changes facing America's schools and students, the author of the new book, The Republic of Virtue, Professor F.H. Buckley. Thank you so much, Professor, for being with us. We well, read thank your, you for having me. Well, you're welcome. We read your op-ed and wanted to have you on. Talk to us about the three major ways that we can improve our education system. Well, the really big one, of course, is school choice. And President Trump called it the civil rights issue of our time. And it's exactly that. I mean, people say they like choice, but they don't want choice for parents with respect to their kids. But the very rich amongst us, they have that kind of choice. They can send their kids to private schools and, and great private schools, and that's fine. But one of the issues in the last campaign was we had become a class society. And there's no better way of breaking the bounds yep. of class than having a good education mm -hmm. system, which we don't have. You said, and, and you talked about politicizing uh, universities. What do you mean by that? Well, there are too many universities where it's actually kind of dangerous to voice conservative opinions. I mean, there, there, there are a number of examples of that. And as well, there is a group think at universities which is highly liberal and uh, dangerous to education. I mean, how do you get educated if everybody thinks the same way? The third thing that you said needs fixing is the enormous student debt burden. How much, what are we talking about as far as numbers are concerned? As far as numbers, we're talking about $1.5 trillion. It's, it's absolutely huge. And here's the problem. The problem is we can't burn off student debt in bankruptcy. And we could up until the 1970s. And back then, the thinking was, well, you know, OK, student debt is small. Tuition is low. There are jobs waiting for people. So we can get rid of the, uh, the discharge for student debt. But now tuition's gone through the roof. And we've made debt slaves out of many of our millennials. And if they become radicalized, big surprise, right? Yeah, I know what you're saying. So they get frustrated. They don't feel they're in the system. The jobs don't pay enough. So then they, they feel disenchanted and they want to so, blame people. That's not a good combination. You say they deserve a right to discharge student loans into bankruptcy? Yep, so, I do. And I'd like to see the burden of that placed on the universities that jacked up tuition. You know, the, the problem is every other country did the same thing we did. They said, we're going to subsidize educational loans. Right, but then they told the universities, right, we're going to do it, but you have to cap your tuition. Well, we didn't do it. It's unbelievable. And yeah, the, yeah, the university just uses an, uh, an excuse to run up the debt. And, uh, the and now with these private schools, some are worth $70,000. 70000 you can't afford yeah. it. I like what you said about choice. I was uh, with someone over the holiday, and they said in their school district they do have the choice. How, how are we seeing that now trickling into more communities throughout the U.S.? Because I thought that was amazing. Because so many, like you said, there's some so many families that can't afford private schools, and so they get to choose what school they're going to send their kids to. Yeah, a number of states are doing that very successfully. I'd like to see much more of that. And I'd like to see precisely what President Trump said right. he wanted, which was you take your kids or your vouchers and you take them to private schools or religious schools mm -hmm. or public schools. That way you get competition. Competition works when you buy toothpaste. Why not schools? That's true. Professor, that's, uh, that's what you're about. Find out more on foxnews.com. Professor Buckley, thanks so much. Thank you. Thank you. By the way, the 529s you can now do it for high schools. I know. That's I know. Good. Private schools. So talk to your accountant because this is the year for right. that. All right. New year. Same resistance from Democrats vowing to turn up the heat on President Trump leading the way. Mr. Bernie Sanders. Yes. And how is your New Year's Eve? Not as good as this one. A bunch of Trump supporters got to crash the Winter White House. One of them joins us live next. It's all about Talk about being in the right place at the right time. A group that gathers in Palm Beach, Florida to welcome the president to Mar-a-Lago got the surprise of a lifetime Saturday when the president invited him in for a visit. How that all happened? Join us right now, Donald Tarka Jr., who got the unexpected private tour from the president. He joins us from our, uh, uh, down in Palm Beach. Donald, good morning to you. Good morning. Okay, so you're out on Southern Boulevard. Uh, you guys are all holding up great big signs that are positive toward the president. Uh, he goes by. 20 minutes later, a white van pulls up, says, hop in. We're going to take you to Mar-a-Lago. What happened next? Oh, yes. Um, yeah, it was a great day. Um, next, they, they brought us in. Uh, they, they brought us over to Mar-a-Lago, and they led us over by the pool. 
Once we got over by the pool, the president came out. Um, he very graciously had us take some group shots uh, around uh, during one of his statues. Yeah. After that, they did individual shots with all of us. And as and I then, look at um, Don, Don, as I look at uh, the pictures right here. For the most part, it doesn't look like anybody was dressed to be meeting the president of the United States. So it's clearly a surprise. Who are you folks that make up the Trump squad? Uh, the, uh, the, the Trump squad is we are a hybrid group of supporters that welcomes all people that support the president, no matter what political affiliations. And we do not believe in identity politics. OK, and I'm um, look, we're looking we, at some of the signs. Somebody held up a sign that said, my hero. When you had the opportunity to finally speak to the president face to face at Mar-a-Lago, what would you tell him? Uh, me personally, I told him my story about uh, NAFTA, about that when I used, used to work for Motorola and NAFTA came in and we built a we built a a plant in Mexico when I was down there in Mexico live, living, working there to get this plant running, that while I was down there, I had lost my job in Boynton Beach. Right. So for me, that was a, a personal feeling I had about the whole effect of NAFTA. Donald Trump is not your regular president, is he? No, he is not. He was, he was, he was so nice and it was so comfortable to talk to him. Um, it, it, it really was like talking to an uncle you've known forever. All right. And in addition to actually meeting the president of the United States, I understand there were snacks. How exactly, how good is the food at Mar-a-Lago? Um, personally, I, we, most of us, I don't think, tried too much. We were so excited about meeting the president that um, the food was really the last thing on our mind. All right. Uh, if the president were watching right now, what would you like to tell him? I would like to thank him. I would really like to thank him. And... Um, for me, the way I felt, for me personally, I was honored that the president, the most powerful man in the world, noticed us and invited us back. It was mind-blowing. And it is a day that this deplorable will never forget that we, the people, do matter. All right. Uh, his name is Donald Tarka Jr. He's part of the Trump squad that holds up the signs as the president whizzes by in his motorcade down in West Palm Beach. Donald, thank you very much. Happy New Year. Thank you very much. All right, good enough. All right, uh, straight ahead on this Monday, uh, this Tuesday, that feels like a Monday, a new bombshell in the investigation into Hillary Clinton's email was the real collusion on the Clintons. There could be proof. Plus, Kellyanne Conway, Congressman Steve Scalise, and Newt Gingrich. We've got a very busy two hours. It starts in about two minutes. Take a deadly turn. 13 people are dead at least. These are the largest protests in Iran since the year 2009. A leaked memo from inside Iran appears to show panic at the highest levels of the Iranian government. The Iranian regime, based on what's happened in the past six days, um, has a kind of underbelly of resentment, but it's not taking care of its own people. Congress gets set to tackle the administration's wish list for 2018. First item on the White House agenda, a meeting with congressional leaders to avoid a government shutdown. There will be a deal on DACA. When you address the DACA issue, you have to address the broader issue of illegal immigration. California officially becoming America's first sanctuary state. <laughs> Don't let me down 2018. By the chain smokers. Right. I wonder okay. if they're going to be chain smokers this year or if that could be a resolution. If you are a chain smoker, make that your resolution. You got to quit. Wait, you, you're talking to the band? I'm t no, yeah. yeah, no, you keep on. But if you're a real chain smoker, you got to quit. I have a good feeling about 2018, although good. January 1st, the tumult is everywhere uh, is around the world. And in fact, Brian? Great segue. Let's start with a Fox News alert and talk about what he's talking about. An Iranian government in panic mode as deadly protests apparently getting close to spiraling out of control. At 
At least 20 people are dead. That violence now spreading across 40 different cities in Iran, with President Trump voicing his support. Yeah, the commander-in-chief is also taking aim at Pakistan. Griff Jenkins is live in Washington. Uh, we're starting off with fa uh, fast and furiously, aren't we, Griff? We are. Happy New Year, and it Happy is New certainly Year. busy. We're hearing, actually, for the first time this morning from the Supreme Leader Ayatollah Khamenei uh, charging that, quote, enemies of Iran are meddling in these protests. These images continuing to flood in and a rising death toll. Plus, 450 people have arrested now after six days of unrest. And the memo you mentioned showing panic at the high, highest levels of the Iranian government. It reads, quote, religious leaders and the leadership must come to the scene as soon as possible and prevent the situation from deteriorating further. God help us. This is a very complex situation and is different from previous occasions. That a nod to the 2009 so-called Green Revolution where demonstrators rose up. Now Iranian President Hassan Rouhani is declaring they will not tolerate these current protests. President Trump is monitoring the situation closely. He's tweeting, Iran is failing at every level despite the terrible deal made with them by the Obama administration. He's supporting the Iranian people and he calls for time for a change. And guys, he's also tweeting on other matters, including Pakistan, putting them on notice, calling them a terrorist haven and cutting funding. He says the United States has foolishly given Pakistan more than $33 billion in aid over the last 15 years. Says no more. Now, a National Security uh, Council official tells Fox News that they indeed plan to withhold $255 million in funding as they review Pakistan's level of cooperation. You see protests recently there. Uh, as far as Iran goes, guys, the State Department says they're considering further sanctions against those responsible for cracking down on those protesters. So as you mentioned, Brian, a busy, busy start to the new year. Yeah, it would be yeah. great if some of our allies backed the president on this and said, you know what, European uh, Union, uh, the European Union might have the same standards that we have in terms of killing protesters, standing up for freedom. All right, Griff, thank you very much for that live report. Look, the president made a good point. If we're spending to the tune of $33 billion over the last 15 years, how much have they really helped us? Remember when, uh, in fact, we're going to have Rob O'Neill, uh, the guy who killed Osama bin Laden, on in the next hour. Remember the night they went in to uh, kill him, well, capture him if they could, but that wasn't going to work out. They couldn't even tell the Pakistan uh, Air National Guard that we were going to fly in because they couldn't trust them. So right. if we can't trust them, why are we giving them all that? Well, I'll, I'll, add, I'll add this to it. They say where the rubber hit the road for this administration, President Trump's administration. Do you remember when those protest, when those uh, hostages were freed? One was an American, but the 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 uh, the dad or the the husband was a Canadian. Remember, about two months ago, they were freed, and um, she was forced to wear a burqa on camera. When they went in there, they captured yeah. a member of the Akani network. So our official said, we need to speak to this guy. He's going to be a Trevor Trove of information. Know what the Pakistani said? No, I don't think so. They mm -hmm. let him go. How could you possibly let a member of the Akani Network, whose pure mission is to kill Americans and upend our work uh, in Afghanistan? So that was where we said, listen, uh, and I think the president's fed up. All right. Well, the Iranian people, the president tweeted about it. He said the Iranian people have been repressed for so many years. They are hungry for food and hungry for freedom. It is time for change. He's also waking up in the White House. He's back from Mar-a-Lago. Behind him, tax reform, what's ahead? The wall, DACA, infrastructure, and the government has to be funded before January 19th. Absolutely. And in fact, uh, the president of the United States uh, did tweet this out. The Democrats have been told and fully understand that there can be no DACA uh, without the desperately needed wall at the southern border and an end to the horrible chain migration and ridiculous lottery system of immigration, et cetera. We must protect our country at all costs. There are a number of uh, Democrats in leadership positions who've really been feeling the heat because uh, their constituency steamed that apparently they were not able to get a DACA deal at the end of the year. Now some are saying, you know what, with this budget thing that's coming up in mid-January, that's the perfect time for maximum leverage. And yet the president has made it clear, it's no emergency. You've got until March to figure out what to do about DACA and immigration. So there's no reason to put it on the January 19th no. uh, spending bill, but that's what uh, Senator Schumer says it's got to be on there and there's going to be no strings attached. Mark Meadows has a different take. He leads the Freedom Caucus. He said, my, uh, my goal is to make those individual tax rates permanent. Well, that's interesting.
So the different the rates that, that Bernie Sanders came out and said, well, they're temporary. Now, all well, Democrats are going to fight against making these uh, tax decreases. Uh, uh, you know, they're going to fight against right. making them permanent. So that everyone's got a lot of agendas going. I well, just wonder if there's a sense of cooperation, they'll get it done. But if Democrats feel as though they can uh, run out the clock for a year in order to get back the House and, and maybe believe, the Senate. Do you have confidence in that cooperation? Well, we haven't seen much of it, but no, why not haven't. try it for a change? We, we haven't should. seen any of it. Mark Meadows in the Freedom Caucus, uh, they're talking about voting to do what the Republicans on Capitol Hill is they're going to need a bunch of Democrats. Yep. So they're ultimately going to have to say, OK, let's work together on this and we'll deal with DACA and the wall in total before the deadline in March. Well, meanwhile, on Sunday night, New Year's Eve night, Bernie Sanders has a, a New Year's resolution that he tweets out. He says, here's a New Year's resolution. I hope you will share with me in 2018, we will not only intensify the struggle against Trumpism, we will increase our efforts to spread the progressive vision uh, in every corner of the land. Right, where they take 90% of your income and just spread it all around. <laughs> Fantastic. Socialism. Yeah, and his, uh, and his main mentor, he's mentoring, of course, our uh, Mayor de Blasio here, who he... Uh, for, of course, Bernie Sanders in his uh, $1,000 jacket showed up at de Blasio's inauguration, re-inauguration, where those two uh, leftists want to get together and make America socialist again. So what does that say to you if Bernie Sanders is uh, helping him get sworn in for another term? It means that he fully is running for president of the United States again. Bernie and de Blasio. Possibly. Because de Blasio keeps popping up you think in Iowa. Be the, their ticket? Have Will they run the as Democrats or socialists? <laughs> well, de Blasio technically is a, is Democrat, a Democrat. although And Bernie is too. He but, ran as a Democrat. But, but Angela, keep in mind, he says, again, I'm an independent. I am not a Democrat. Yeah. If I'm a Democrat, I'd say, listen, you're not going to use our apparatus to run for president of the United States while saying I'm an independent because fundamentally he did not have, you would think, a lot of the principles Democrats run on. For example, a moderate like Governor Hickenlooper in Colorado couldn't be more different than Bernie Sanders, who's going to be running. And the two leaders right now are considered to be Joe Biden, who will be 78 if he wins election on Inauguration Day, and Bernie Sanders, who will be 79. I think the rank and file Democrats want some new faces. And we got a whole year before the elections come in November. That's true. God. And they're off. All right. It is 7.09 here in New York City where it's 13 degrees. Jillian joins us with Good some morning. headlines. It is cold out there. And we are actually starting with uh, some breaking news right now. So let's begin with this Fox News alert and a live look at a massive fire consuming a four-story building in New York City. FDNY reporting 12 injuries, but it's unclear how serious they are. Just take a look at that. The ground level of the building is occupied by a furniture store. There are apartments on the upper levels. Firefighters battling the flames in just, as Steve mentioned, 13 degree temperatures. This comes just days after 12 people were killed at another fire in the same part of New York City. We'll keep you posted. An emotional candlelight, candlelight vigil held overnight to honor a fallen sheriff's deputy in Colorado. Hundreds gathering to remember 29-year-old Zachary Parrish, killed in an ambush attack on New Year's Eve. He leaves behind a wife and two young daughters. His four-year-old trying to comfort her mom at the vigil. Take a listen. I want to hear about him and I want to soak it in. Okay. The gunman, Matthew Riel, was an Iraq war veteran and lawyer who ranted against cops online. He fired more than 100 rounds on Parrish and other deputies before being killed by a SWAT team. Vice President Pence is going to Israel as planned, his office confirming he will visit the Holy Land later this month after Israel's foreign ministry claimed it was no longer on his schedule. Pence was originally planned to visit last month, but the trip was pushed back for the Senate tax vote. It also followed intense criticism over President Trump's decision to recognize Jerusalem as Israel's capital. Meet the twins in California, born in two different years. Baby boy Joaquin, born on December 31st, 2017, at 11.58 p.m. The younger twin sister, Aitana, arriving about 20 minutes later at 12.16 a.m., January 1st, 2018. It was a total surprise. They weren't due for another month. But mom and babies are doing great. Many congrats. That is cool. so fun. I know. Let me ask him, why do, why, do every, why do all newborns have that same blanket? 
<laughs> like with the same <laughs> Because it's, colors. it's the one the hospital gives you. No, right, you don't but, know but, that. Like, you would you think that some that. hospitals want to put a right. signature on it. I did not know that until I had a baby. And I remember looking at a baby picture and saying, oh, that's such a cute They blanket. give you the hat and the blanket. Did you get that every ahead hospital, of time? Every hospital. My right? mom's a nurse, so that's... Okay, because it's like blue and pink. Can you call yeah. her and just ask? Like, why do we have... Why <laughs> what's the name of that company? Can you guys help us with that? Why? And they, they're great looking blankets. They, they well, are. So what's the problem then? How did every hospital get the same stripes? Whoever owns that company is making a mess. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> All right. All, right. Uh, all right. Thanks Thank a lot, uh, Jillian. Twelve minutes after the hour, a new bombshell in the Hillary investigation of her email. It was exposed thanks to Judicial Watch. Well, Florida Congressman Matt Gates says the real collusion was on the Clintons, and there's proof as to the 2,800 emails are now released for all of us to read. And Kellyanne Conway, she is here live. What's on the president's agenda for 2018, and how will he get the Democrats on board? We'll ask her. Bombshell in the Clinton email probe for the first time congressional investigators reportedly finding irrefutable proof that FBI agents felt Clinton had broken the law when sending classified information on her personal server. So what happened? That's the question. Republican lawmakers, including our next guest, are now more convinced than ever that FBI leadership rigged the outcome to clear Clinton. Congressman Matt Gates is a member of the House Judiciary Committee. He joins us from a very, very chilly Pensacola, Florida today. Good morning, Congressman. Good morning. Okay, so from what you have seen so far, what's this irrefutable proof that uh, the FBI knew that she had broken some laws and yet they didn't do anything? Well, the very front line FBI investigators who were involved in evaluating the claims in the Hillary Clinton email scandal uh, tended to believe that there was a violation of the law. And we see that in the early drafts of Jim Comey's statement where the term grossly negligent was used. It was only after several drafts that that was actually changed to extremely careless, which would absolve Hillary Clinton of criminal culpability. And the real question is who were the people at the Department of Justice or elsewhere that had control? over actual evidence that were helping Hillary Clinton. That's what we've got to find out. Well, and those uh, early drafts exonerating her, essentially, were written even before they talked to her, even before they talked to the IT guy, before they talked to everybody. It looks like, to some Republicans I know, uh, that the FBI was out to clear her. Well, when you have an exoneration statement drafted before the very meat of the investigation is conducted, it certainly raises questions as to the integrity in that investigation. You have to wonder if the FBI no longer trusted the Department of Justice as a consequence of the tarmac meeting between Loretta Lynch and Bill Clinton, why would the FBI allow the Department of Justice to then control access to people and access to evidence that they would need in this particular case? And so there's another of inconsistencies that I certainly saw from the testimony that Andrew McCabe has given over time to the Congress. And I don't think it's a coincidence that Andrew McCabe announced his retirement from the FBI just days after providing sworn testimony to the Judiciary Committee. So in 2018, expect more depositions, more sworn testimony, and a real uh, expectation from the Congress that the Department of Justice and FBI will comply with the subpoenas that we have sent them. Our patience is wearing thin. I can understand that completely. So uh, just to review what you just said, uh, Andrew McCabe, the number two guy at the FBI, you said there were inconsistencies in his testimony. So in other words, his story is not the same as he's told before. Well, Andrew McCabe has given testimony on a variety of occasions. He's also written emails that designated the Hillary Clinton investigation as an HQ special, meaning that a small group of people would make all the decisions rather than the normal process at the Washington field office. And so, yes, I believe there were circumstances in a variety of statements that Andrew McCabe made both before Congress and in his emails that were inconsistent and that don't show a clear um, line of communication and a clear chain of authority in the Hillary Clinton email scandal. That's not the type of rule of law that we want to see in this country. We need to change our processes and procedures so that there's more transparency and more oversight so that no one ever gets away with something just sure. because they're running for president of the United States. Congressman, earlier you had said essentially you were, you were trying to figure out who at the FBI might have been doing these things. Is Andrew McCabe one of your the people you are most interested in getting more answers to because of the inconsistencies in his testimony? 
Well, we'll have to conduct more interviews and get access to more documents. That's why tomorrow is such an important day. It is literally the deadline that Chairman Devin Nunes has set for the production of documents and availability of witnesses so that we could determine whether or not it was people at the FBI or at the Department of Justice who were actually paving the way for a Hillary Clinton exoneration, even though that's not where the facts were leading. And, you know, ultimately, Congressman, it comes down to this. Nobody at the FBI thought Donald Trump would ever win for the most part, and he did. And had she won, we wouldn't know about any of this stuff, would we? Well, you're absolutely right, and it actually begs the question, why were some of the very people involved in clearing Hillary Clinton then drafted onto the Mueller probe to go and persecute the president? It seems very suspect that people who were already engaging in nefarious activity to clear Hillary Clinton, even though there was evidence of a crime, end up being the very same people that Bob, Bob Mueller goes and curates to join his team. And so a lot of questions still unanswered, and the president was right in his recent interview. This really hurts the United States' efforts around the world, whether that's with Iran or North Korea or okay. Venezuela. We need to get this off the president's uh, desk right. and have him focused on preserving the country. Maybe some answers in 2018. All right, Congressman, thank you very much for the live report. Thank you. All right. Uh, meanwhile, coming up on this Tuesday, marijuana sales on fire in California, but is it going to pot a good idea for America? Our next guest is a former drug addict and has, has a warning everybody needs to hear. Higher reign of Playboy magazine. Months after founder Hugh Hefner died, the company reportedly considering ending its print publication. Instead, Playboy would focus on brand partnerships and licensing deal. No word if they'll get back into the restaurant business. Next zero. That's how many people died on commercial jet accidents in 2017. Good job, commercial jet pilots. That, according to new reports, that makes it the safest year for commercial flying ever. Take that, 2018. And finally, $783 million. That's the combined jackpot for this week's Mega Millions and Powerball lotteries. Your odds of winning both? One in 88 quadrillion. So <laughs> it's basically a layup. So you're saying there's a chance. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> Thanks, Brian. Hundreds of people lining up to light up in California. Long lines wrapping around marijuana dispensaries on the first day of legal recreational sales in that state. That happened yesterday. Anyone over 21 can grow or use a limited amount of the drug. It could be a boom for the economy, supporters say, but is it worth it? Here to weigh in is the head of the International Faith-Based Coalition and former drug addict himself, Bishop Ron Allen. Bishop, thank you for being with us. Good morning and Happy New Year. Happy New Year to you, too. So I have heard that, and I've heard this from drug addicts, say that this is a gateway drug. This is how they got hooked. Is that your story? That is my story. Marijuana is still the number one gateway drug next to alcohol. And the state of California is in for a great downfall. This is not the way to make money. Yeah, they're saying that this is a way to regulate it keep people safe and a way to make money because they're going to start taxing this drug and they're saying it's already in our state we might as well profit from it but you say that's that's a slippery slope not a good thing absolutely not you know uh, the, the holy bible is still true money is still the root to all evil it's a sad day for the state of california and it is a betrayal for uh, our elected officials to put political gain and financial gain in front of the safety, uh, public safety and safety of the citizens of the state of California, United States. You got to be kidding me. Uh, crime is going to go up. Drug driving is going to go up. Emergency room visits are going to go up. Uh, addictions are going to go up. Dropouts are going to more dropouts are going to happen. And I guarantee you uh, that uh, most of the stores are going to open up in the underserved community. We're not doing good with tobacco, and we're not doing good with alcohol. What in the world makes our elected officials think we're going to do good with a Schedule One illicit drug called marijuana? What does this say about the culture of our country and where we're going? It, it, it tells us that we need to be praying. I hope I can say that. Please let me put on my bishop hat. Yes, you can say that. Because our elected, our elected officials have lost their minds. Uh, when they think that they can regulate, control an illicit drug, a drug that is very highly addictive, and you don't know the potency of it at mm -hmm. all. Mm -hmm. 
uh, people are killing people, losing their mind. It acerbates mental health, and they think they can regulate it because they want money. Come on now. How about the citizens? How about the future of this nation, elected officials? Bishop, How about that? Bishop, if you had the elected officials in front of you in the state of California or other states that have done some, the same thing, what would you say to them? Tell us your story. I would say to them that I was on marijuana. I started with marijuana. And I know that people say, well, everyone doesn't have an addictive personality. I'm sorry. Uh, marijuana is so elusive. That's why they're messing with it. They think that it's like tobacco or something. I'm not sure. Uh, and and, and, and tobacco is, is, is very bad. Uh, but I started with marijuana. And you start with one joint. And you go to two joints. And you go to five joints. And you go to ten joints. Because after a while, five joints won't get you high. And then when ten joints uh, will not get you high, you start lacing it with crack cocaine or PCP. And so this is what we're going to see in the state of California and across this nation. Marijuana is absolutely the greatest crossover drug ever for any other uh, drug to be added to it, especially alcohol. We are headed down a dark road and we need God to intervene for us or we need the the Trump administration parents, to push back All right. on this. Bishop, thank you so much. I'm glad God changed your life. Thank you for coming on and, and warning us about this drug and what it can mean for our country. God bless you. Thank you, sir. Pray. Thank you for having me. You're welcome. Coming up, President Trump just tripled down, tripled down on his support for the protesters in Iran. His message, far different than that of President Obama. And Democrats have been screaming Russia, Russia, Russia since Inauguration Day. But now Hillary Clinton's former campaign manager has seen the light. Time in our nation's capital. Let's go down to the North Lawn of the White House and Kellyanne Conway. Oh, I'm sorry. She's in the bureau. Of course she is because it's freezing outside. Good morning to <laughs> Good you. Good morning. Good morning. The real feel is 1%. So they put me here in your beautiful bureau. That's the capital behind me, America. That's Happy right. Happy New Year. And uh, some things have to get done in the capital. In a couple of weeks, you've got to right. uh, you've got to figure out how to fund the government. Democrats want some sort of a DACA deal. Kellyanne, would you just kind of lay out for the next month what's going to happen between the president and Congress? Yes. So the ambitious agenda of President Trump that helped fuel his election over a year ago will continue. You saw how strong December was. I think in Washington, the tradition is to not work very hard in August or December. This president has reversed that. And with the help of the Congress, passed some very meaningful legislation late in the game. Uh, massive tax cuts for the middle class, repatriating that money, certainly opening up ANWR for the first time in 40 years. It had been attempted right. for decades. It's now a reality. And of course, repealing the individual mandate, the regulatory reform, the declaring a national public health emergency and the opioid crisis. Mm -hmm. ISIS is in retreat. The caliphate is destroyed. There's so much that is added to the security and prosperity of Americans in 2017. That will now drift into 2018. The specific agenda items, and we certainly hope we will get Democratic support on them, include the budget, getting some reasonable budget caps uh, and maybe a budget deal for the next two years certainly mm -hmm. it includes welfare reform the dignity of work this is a president that's invested in all types of careers and is trying to tell americans that we dignify every type of work there is the apprenticeship and workforce development opportunities where there's skills and jobs training not everybody is cut out for college and that's fine we want folks to be able to graduate from high school community college with a right. skill and get to work this president will continue to work on welfare reform also infrastructure we need to rebuild our well, nation's roads and bridges and and certainly our air traffic key, control system right. and, the, and the key is going to be the order in which it's done the house has an order and they say let's do That's welfare right. uh, reform let's do food stamp reform and the senate says hey no we have barely a majority i'm not going to be able to get that done and the president talks about infrastructure if you were, do you know of any indications behind the scenes of Democratic leadership and Republican leadership and the president interacting before tomorrow's meeting that might give the American people some hope that there might be some cooperation and compromise? 
You know that this president is open to taking all those calls and those meetings. He's here working. He worked over the, the break, and he continues to meet with uh, those leaders on, in both chambers and in both parties. And I know the big four are set to meet this week uh, with our OMB director, Tomorrow. Mick Mulvaney, with our, that's right, with our, that's Wednesday already, with our uh, director of legislative affairs, Mark Short. And then the president this weekend will be hosting Leader McConnell and Speaker Ryan at Camp David to continue that discussion about a robust agenda for 2018. So this, I think America should look at this as a very positive development. We hope, and let me make clear again on behalf of the president, we want democratic support for these measures. We wanted it on middle class tax cuts. We wanted it to improve the access and availability and affordability of health care. But now if you don't get 60 votes, Americans you can't pass anything. But now, well, you're, now you need 60 votes to to, to get that spending done by January 19th and to get anything done. So now there's... We certainly hope so. We know that many of those Democrats who are up for re-election this year in states that President Trump carried and, and five of them carried by significant double digits, we would think they'll be able to look at their constituents and say, when I had an opportunity to keep the government open, uh, to have some reasonable budget caps, and to make sure at the same time that we have our military defense needs Spent, spent for that we are accommodating those that I, I went ahead and did that. I didn't allow mm -hmm. petty partisan politics to get in the way because we saw that in 2017. I thought 2017 was a disappointment when it came to bipartisan action. A lot of bipartisan talk and a president who always had that olive branch extended, mm -hmm. had them at the White House, had them on the phone, went up to Capitol Hill and, and certainly listened to their concerns. He's made very clear that there is no deal on DACA unless the wall is built unless there is funding for the wall. He's made this very clear that this president is so accessible and so transparent on these policy prescriptions. He tweets about them almost daily, if not daily, including over the he break, does. the well, Christmas we'll break. And so everybody knows where he stands on this. We hope they can come together for the good of the country. He's well, ready. Speaking of that, we watched as Hillary Clinton was on the campaign trail. We were covering that, of course, and you, you're in the White House because this president won because he understood the American people. Hillary Clinton, remember she went out there and she said, I'm gonna shut down these coal mines and that guy, that, the miner, put, put a picture in front of her and said, yeah, said, the wait, this is the family you're going to fire. So the, Hillary Clinton campaign manager, Robbie Mook, he was on one of the networks this weekend, and he was talking about how he's starting to learn. He's watching the Trump campaign and saying, all right, they got it. They understood what the American people really wanted. And he's saying this Russia, Russia, Russia thing, that narrative's not going to work anymore going forward. Listen to what he said, and we'll get your reaction don't think the Russia investigation is a winning message. You know, mm -hmm. voters are seek they, they they watch and they look to see what your priorities seem to be. This is actually why the Republicans are looking to have a fight over immigration. They want to send a signal to voters the Democrats are not focused on the voters, they're focused on 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 uh, immigration and, and and that sort of thing. And and obviously it's an important issue, but the Re the Republicans see that as a helpful wedge mm. uh, for their base. Um, so I think Democrats need to run on what everybody always needs to run on, which is uh, what are you doing for the voters? What's in it for them? Kellyanne, did you fall out of your chair when you heard that he said that? No, because Robbie Mook's a very smart guy, and people should have listened to him and others who were, I think, ringing the alarm bell, saying, let's, let's make sure we're talking about the issues that connect with America. And you're absolutely right. That is how Donald Trump won the election. He had a more compelling, persuasive, economically optimistic, and specific message. He put out his list of 20 or 21 possible Supreme Court justices. He talked specifically about how to create 25 million jobs over 10 years, how to responsibly develop our own energy energy and we're doing that now how to have meaningful and uh, reasonable regulations not ones that are burdensome and overwrought right. but Robbie Mook is also telling the broader Democratic Party that you I'm telling them anyway that you wasted 2017 talking about Russia not America right. and you basically have held up a stop sign of resist and obstruct if anybody can tell me what the Democratic Party stands for I'm listening and I used sure. to ask that about Hillary what what exactly is her message if your message is you, the uh, the opposition is terrible and we're not them that's not a message. Sure. And you look at 2020, they're talking about all these uh, left, hard left of center candidates coming to the fore. They're going to nominate someone who's so far out of the mainstream, who voted against middle class tax right. cuts, who, who's not funding the military the way it needs to be, and, and who's looking the other way on Iran and right. Pakistan. So let's and talk about yeah. Iran. Uh, the Wall Street Journal, Kellyanne, is, uh, as we all know, there's a wave of protests throughout Iran. 
the uh, biggest since 2009. The president has been doing some tweeting. The Wall Street Journal is now quoting the State Department as saying that they will threaten the company, the country with new sanctions unless they allow the protest to happen, right? Yes, that's right. And this president, again, very transparently through his tweets, he said he stands with the Iranian people and he knows that they're looking for freedom and they're against corruption. And, and look, thank you for, for rolling that tape. I think America, well, the world needs to see what's happening in that's Iran right now. That's what freedom looks like right there. That's what freedom looks like. And, and this president stands with the Iranian people and he doesn't want to remain silent the way too many people were silent in 2009. But so, Kellyanne, here's the deal. Uh, we know the series of protests came up, and the president did not waste any time in coming out and supporting the Iranian people. But as Senator Lindsey Graham, in backing up the president's doing something that President Obama didn't, and that is quickly support the protesters, said it's got to be more than a tweet. We understand there's one move they just made by saying, I, I'm calling for more sanctions on Iran, but we really don't have much trade with them to begin with. What do you think the big policy will be? How close are do you think a major policy announcement about this? And who do you think the, pre the president's going to get most of his advice from when he comes out with a reaction to these Iranian protests? The president is in constant contact with his national security and State Department teams. I mean, that's who he confers with. He'll have his daily intelligence briefing today. This will be a major issue that he continues to to discuss with the National Security Council and others, obviously the Pentagon and his generals, as he says. And I'm not going to get ahead of the president